Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to Nepal. Um, as most of you know, I'm relatively new here, and it's good to see my old uh, friends from the Bureau of Food Security who've come to visit us here. Uh, we're very excited to host this um, important meeting and really looking forward to some very interesting discussions, being able to show you what we're doing on the ground, um, learn how much more we can do on the ground. Um, it's going to be a great week. So uh, we had the privilege of hosting uh, the week before last Dr. Shaw in Nepal. So we've had a lot of visitors and it's been really exciting for all of us. And we've been highlighting the work we've done, what we're doing in Nepal and really, really focusing on what our past work and our future work will do to leverage science, technology, innovation, and partnership to drive economic growth and development. That was an integral part of the visit. It's an integral part of his message. And I think that the meeting we're having this week is the perfect way to um, push this all forward. Um, it was a visit where Dr. Shaw both lauded, inspired, and challenged us all to recognize and harness, harness the power of STIP science, technology, innovation, and partnership as we seek to end extreme poverty and transform the world around us. So one of the exciting parts about being here with Dr. Shaw during the visit was watching how, wherever we went, even on the helicopter ride to see firsthand Nepal's melting glaciers, he emphasized what he called the new model of development where we seek to draw more from innovation and partnerships which is what we're doing here this week. The partners of the Innovation Labs on the heels of Dr. Shaw's visit, like I said, couldn't have come at a better time. At, as Dr. Shaw noted in the speech he gave at the first economic, Nepal Economic Summit, growth tied to gains in agricultural productivity is up to three times more effective at raising the incomes of, of the poor than growth in any other sector, which I know you all know, it's very important. In Nepal, 75% of the population makes its livelihoods from agriculture, and in a country where agriculture development is so closely linked with ending extreme poverty, we cannot but view Feed the Future Innovation Labs as an important, contribute, important contributor to our overall goal of ending extreme poverty. So we have multiple innovation labs working here in Nepal. We're working with um, the nutrition, integrated pest management, horticulture, SANREM, and the Adapting Livestock Systems to Climate Change Innovation Labs. And we're excited to learn what else is out there as well. As part of Dr. Shah's visit, we were able to take him to see an IDE Nepal project outside of Kathmandu that works with the IPM Innovation Lab on new pest management technologies for vegetable production. Not only did he view the small scale technology, but he also engaged the private sector in a discussion about how we scale up these technologies, use of improved seeds, biofertilizers, drip irrigation, and value chains for high value crops. This, is, this discussion especially focused on women farmers and how their lands can be more productive. So I've been told that some of you will be joining IDE Nepal for a one day field trip and will have an opportunity to see this very important effort. So we're looking forward to do that. Thank you all for taking the time to do that. And I can't stress enough how important the work of the Innovation Labs is. <clears throat> Again, in Nepal, a quarter of the population live in extreme poverty. Um, I know that's the case in many places where you work. In South Asia, it's the poorest country and the 23rd poorest country nation uh, worldwide. So many members of Nepal's marginalized communities face historic socioeconomic barriers making it difficult or even impossible to break out of the cycle of poverty. Every year, more than 550,000 people, mostly youth, join the ranks of job seekers, many of whom who go abroad as unskilled laborers and, or languish as part of the unproductive work, workforce. So I think migrant labor here is, it's a huge part of the country's um, GDP. It's a huge part of um, the country's coping mechanism. And while it has positive, uh, positive benefits for the remittances that come back, I think that agriculture is seen as in areas where we've seen it be more productive. People are choosing to stay home um, and work in agriculture where, it can, where they can make um, a good living because the migration is, is, really, is really tough on, on a lot of different people. So, um, so and agriculture, like we said, makes up 75% of the workforce, but crop yields are considerably lower than the regional average. Some things in the agri agriculture sector are working. Um, high yield crops are growing by 7% a year, but many constraints hamper the sector. Low investment, poor extension services, links with, um, poor re links with research, failure, failure to commercialize opportunities, and very few processing and value added industries 
among other, among other issues. And as I said, linked to the migration issue, we're facing a feminization of agriculture, which is <clears throat> driven by the male out migration. 75% of Nepali women, and that's higher on our Feed the Future zone of influence, which is in the west, midwest, and far west regions of the hills in Terai. <clears throat> 75% of Nepali women work in agriculture, just 35% of men. So this trend has created new, mostly unexamined opportunities and challenges for women and children who are left behind to run farms. Uh, women farmers still suffer disadvantage in terms of access to land, technology, seeds, irrigation, credit, which results in lower productivity and prices. So reflecting their lack of capital, women are typically more involved in producing subsistence crops and raising small livestock, while men often raise large animals and produce cash crops. So three quarters of Nepali women are working in agriculture unpaid, compared to only 20% of women in other sectors, often working for family members. And only 3% of women working in agriculture are self-employed. So there's a lot of issues around, um, around the feminization of agriculture that we need to learn more about and how do we scale in this environment. Also the country's nutritional status is alarming with stunting, wasting, and underweight rates sim similar to Sudan and Ethiopia. Two thirds of Nepali suffer food insecurity during the year. <clears throat> so there's been steady progress from the government of Nepal to address these challenges. Um, and Nepal, for example, has really experienced one of the greatest increases in the human development index since 1980, um, on track to reach several millennium development goals. But of course, there, there's still a long way to go. <clears throat> so the government has clearly stated that food security is an urgent national priority and is a very strong partner for USAID. And we're looking forward to the Secretary of Agriculture arriving soon to tell you more about that partnership. And as I mentioned earlier, the country's on track to meet three Millennium Development Goals, which is universal primary education, reduced child mortality, and improved maternal health. But again, this is just the beginning of the road to ending extreme poverty and achieve broad-based inclusive growth in Nepal. There are many challenges and weaknesses which must be addressed in order for Nepal to reach its potential and put the country's great assets a very industrious and hardworking population, vast water res resources, incredible natural beauty, and its position at the doorstep of huge neighboring markets. So we really need to take advantage of all of that. Um, in Nepal, over the next five years, USAID aims to reduce um, the prevalence of extreme poverty under $1.25 a day, um, <clears throat> mainly in the 20 districts of the West, Midwest, and Far West that I mentioned. Um, from 32.5% to 22%. Again, the poverty rate is higher in the Feed the Future zone of influence where we're, where we're working than the rest of the country. So it's a big goal. Um, um, we'll see. We are investing $413 million total over the next five years, and $121 million of that is in economic growth, mostly in agriculture, um, with a comparative advantage from, let's see, so anyway, so these efforts, like as I said, in reducing the poverty rate from 32 to 25, will target almost 800,000 in food insecure Nepalis. Um, effective partnerships with both the private sector and the government are going to be key to how much we achieve and how much we achieve sustainably going forward. And so I'm pleased that you have the opportunity to learn more about our investments and see some of them later in the week. So we look forward to a robust discussion about what you all can learn from what we're doing here and what we can learn from what you're doing in other places around the world. So really looking forward to that. So the Feed the Future Innovation Labs bring the best the university science community has to offer to developing country challenges, partnering with national institutions to work together. Over the week, I hope you, eat, you all develop new partnerships for collaboration so that some of your work is greater than our individual efforts. Let us take advantage of the diverse group of partners pre present here this week to better connect our research and our development programs with each other. And by strengthening these collaborations and bringing an impact-focused approach to our work, we can ensure that the Feed the Future Innovation Labs and other research partners are well positioned to deliver the innovation, knowledge, and capacity that are needed to advance development at scale. Thank you again for participating in this important workshop, and I look forward to engaging with you all over the next week. To learn more, please visit agrilinks.org and feedthefuture.gov. And to learn more about this mission's activities, please visit 
www.usaid.gov/nepal.